Chapter Lux Vice 778 I don't mean to give her any but Terrasona, said Sancho, which will go well with her stoutness, and with her own right name, as she is called Teresa, and then when I sing her praises in my verses I'll show how chaste my passion is, for I'm not going to look for better bread than ever came from wheat in other men's houses. It won't do for the curate to have a shepherdess, for the sake of good example, and if the bachelor chooses to have one, that is his look minus out. God bless me, Sancho my friend, said Don Quixote, what a life we shall lead. What hoboys and Zamora bagpipes we shall hear, what tabers, timbrels, and rebecks. And then if among all these different sorts of music that of the albogs is heard, almost all the pastoral instruments will be there. What are albogs? asked Sancho, for I never in my life heard tell of them or saw them. Albogs, said Don Quixote, are brass plates like candlesticks that struck against one another on the hollow side make a noise which, if not very pleasing or harmonious, is not disagreeable and accords very well with the rude notes of the bagpipe and tabor. The word albog is morisco, as are all those in our Spanish tongue that begin with al, for example, almohaza, almorzer, alhambra, alguacil, alhusima, almason, alcancia, and others of the same sort, of which there are not many more. Our language has only three that are morisco and end in i, which are borsegi, zakwazami, and maravedi. Alheli and Alphaca are seen to be Arabic, as well by the al at the beginning as by the they end with. I mention this incidentally, the chance allusion to albogs having reminded me of it, and it will be of great assistance to us in the perfect practice of this calling that I am something of a poet, as thou knowest, and that besides the bachelor Samson Carrasco is an accomplished one of the curate I say nothing, but I will wager he has some spice of the poet in him and no doubt Master Nicholas too, for all barbers, or most of them, are guitar players and stringers of verses. I will bewail my separation, thou shalt glorify thyself as a constant lover, the shepherd Carascan will figure as a rejected one, and the curate Curiambro as whatever may please him best, and so all will go as gaily as heart could wish. To this Sancho made answer, I am so unlucky, senor, that I'm afraid the day will never come when I'll see myself at such a calling. Oh what neat spoons I'll make when I'm a shepherd! What messes, creams, garlands, pastoral odds and ends! And if they don't get me a name for wisdom, they'll not fail to get me one for ingenuity. My daughter Sanchica will bring us our dinner to the pasture. But stay minus she's good minus looking and shepherds there are with more mischief than simplicity in them. I would not have her come for wool and go back shorn. Love minus making and lawless desires are just as common in the fields as in the cities, and in shepherd shanties as in royal palaces, do away with the cause, you do away with the sin, if eyes don't see hearts don't break and better a clear escape than good men's prayers. Don Quixote Chapter Lux Vice 779 A truce to thy proverbs, Sancho, exclaimed Don Quixote, any one of those thou hast uttered would suffice to explain thy meaning, Many a time have I recommended thee not to be so lavish with proverbs and to exercise some moderation in delivering them, but it seems to me it is only preaching in the desert. My mother beats me, and I go on with my tricks. It seems to me, said Sancho, that your worship is like the common saying, said the frying minus pan to the kettle, get away, black breech. You chide me for uttering proverbs, and you string them in couples yourself. Observe, Sancho, replied Don Quixote. I bring in proverbs to the purpose, and when I quote them they fit like a ring to the finger, thou bringest them in by the head and shoulders, in such a way that thou dost drag them in, rather than introduce them, if I am not mistaken, I have told thee already that proverbs are short maxims drawn from the experience and observation of our wise men of old, but the proverb that is not to the purpose is a piece of nonsense and not a maxim. But enough of this, as nightfall is drawing on let us retire some little distance from the high road to pass the night. What is in store for us to minus morrow God knoweth. They turned aside, and supped late and poorly, very much against Sancho's will, who turned over in his mind the hardships attendant upon night minus errantry in woods and forests, even though at times plenty presented itself in castles and houses, as at Don Diego de Miranda's, at the wedding of Camacho the Rich, and at Don Antonio Moreno's, he reflected, however, that it could not be always day, nor always night. And so that night he passed in sleeping, and his master in waking. 
Don Quixote. Chapter Lux by 780. Chapter Lux VI. Of the bristly adventure that befell Don Quixote. The night was somewhat dark, for though there was a moon in the sky, it was not in a quarter where she could be seen, for sometimes the Lady Diana goes on a stroll to the Antipodes and leaves the mountains all black and the valleys in darkness. Don Quixote obeyed nature so far as to sleep his first sleep, but did not give way to the second, very different from Sancho, who never had any second, because with him sleep lasted from night till morning, wherein he showed what a sound constitution and few cares he had. Don Quixote's cares kept him restless so much, so that he awoke Sancho and said to him, I am amazed, Sancho, at the unconcern of thy temperament. I believe thou art made of marble or hard brass, incapable of any emotion or feeling whatever. I lie awake while thou sleepest, I weep while thou singest, I am faint with fasting while thou art sluggish and torpid from pure repletion. It is the duty of good servants to share the sufferings and feel the sorrows of their masters, if it be only for the sake of appearances. See the calmness of the night, the solitude of the spot, inviting us to break our slumbers by a vigil of some sort. Rise as thou livest, and retire a little distance, and with a good heart and cheerful courage give thyself three or four hundred lashes on account of Dulcinea's disenchantment score, and this I entreat of thee, making it a request, for I have no desire to come to grips with thee a second time, as I know thou hast a heavy hand. As soon as thou hast laid them on we will pass the rest of the night, I singing my separation, thou thy constancy, making a beginning at once with the pastoral life we are to follow at our village. Senor, replied Sancho, I'm no monk to get up out of the middle of my sleep and scourge myself, nor does it seem to me that one can pass from one extreme of the pain of whipping to the other of music. Will your worship let me sleep and not worry me about whipping myself? Or you'll make me swear never to touch a hair of my doublet, not to say my flesh. O oh, hard heart, said Don Quixote, O oh, pitiless squire. O oh, bread ill minus bestowed and favors ill minus acknowledged, both those I have done thee, and those I mean to do thee. Through me hast thou seen thyself a governor, and through me thou sayest thyself an immediate expectation of being a count, or obtaining some other equivalent title, for I minus post tenebris spirulusum. I don't know what that is, said Sancho, all I know is that so long as I am asleep I have neither fear nor hope, trouble nor glory, and good luck betide him that invented sleep, the cloak that covers over all a man's thoughts, the food that removes hunger, the drink that drives away thirst, the fire that warms the cold, the cold that tempers the heat, and to wind. Don Quixote Chapter Lux VI 781 up with, the universal coin wherewith everything is bought, the weight and balance that makes the shepherd equal with the king and the fool with the wise man. Sleep, I have heard say, has only one fault, that it is like death, for between a sleeping man and a dead man there is very little difference. Never have I heard thee speak so elegantly as now, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and here I begin to see the truth of the proverb thou dost sometimes quote, not with whom thou art bred, but with whom thou art fed. Ha, by my life, master mine, said Sancho, it's not I that am stringing proverbs now, for they drop in pairs from your worship's mouth faster than from mine, only there is this difference between mine and yours, that yours are well minus timed and mine are untimely, but anyhow, they are all proverbs. At this point they became aware of a harsh indistinct noise that seemed to spread through all the valleys around. Don Quixote stood up and laid his hand upon his sword and Sancho ensconced himself under Dapple, and put the bundle of armor on one side of him, and the ass's pack minus saddle on the other, in fear and trembling as great as Don Quixote's perturbation. Each instant the noise increased and came nearer to the two terrified men, or at least to one, for as to the other, his courage is known to all. The fact of the matter was that some men were taking above six hundred pigs to sell at a fair, and were on their way with them at that hour and so great was the noise they made, and their grunting and blowing, that they deafened the ears of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, and they could not make out what it was. The wide minus spread grunting drove came on in a surging mass, and without showing any respect for Don Quixote's dignity or Sancho's, passed right over the pair of them. Demolishing Sancho's entrenchments, and not only upsetting Don Quixote but sweeping. Rocinante off his feet into the bargain, 
and what with the trampling and the grunting and the pace at which the unclean beasts went, Pack minus saddle, armor, Dapple and Rocinante were left scattered on the ground in Sancho and Don Quixote at their wit's end. Sancho got up as well as he could and begged his master to give him his sword, saying he wanted to kill half a dozen of those dirty unmannerly pigs, for he had by this time found out that that was what they were. Let them be, my friend, said Don Quixote, this insult is the penalty of my sin, and it is the righteous chastisement of heaven that jackals should devour a vanquished knight and wasps sting him and pigs trample him underfoot. I suppose it is the chastisement of heaven too, said Sancho, that flies should prick the squires of vanquished knights, and lice eat them, and hunger assail them. If we squires were the sons of the knights we serve, or their very near relations, it would be no wonder if the penalty of their misdeeds overtook us, even to the fourth generation. But what have the panzas to do with the Quixotes? Well, well, let's lie down again and sleep out what little of. Don Quixote Chapter LXVI 782 The night there's left, and God will send us dawn, and we shall be all right. Sleep thou, Sancho, returned Don Quixote, for thou wast born to sleep as I was born to watch, and during the time it now wants of dawn I will give a loose rein to my thoughts, and seek a vent for them in a little madrigal which, unknown to thee, I composed in my head last night. I should think, said Sancho, that the thoughts that allow one to make verses cannot be of great consequence. Let your worship string verses as much as you like and I'll sleep as much as I can, and forthwith, taking the space of ground he required, he muffled himself up and fell into a sound sleep, undisturbed by bond, debt, or trouble of any sort. Don Quixote, Propped up against the trunk of a beech or a cork tree minus four side hammy does not specify what kind of tree it was minus sang in this strain to the accompaniment of his own size. When in my mind I muse, O love, upon thy cruelty, to death I flee, in hope therein the end of all to find. But drawing near that welcome haven in my sea of woe, such joy I know, that life revives, and still I linger here. Thus life doth slay, and death again to life restoreth me, strange destiny, that deals with life and death as with a play. He accompanied each verse with many sighs and not a few tears, just like one whose heart was pierced with grief at his defeat and his separation from Dulcinea. And now daylight came, and the sun smote Sancho on the eyes with his beams. He awoke, roused himself up, shook himself and stretched his lazy limbs, and seeing the havoc the pigs had made with his stores he cursed the drove, and more besides. Then the pair resumed their journey, and as evening closed and they saw coming towards them some ten men on horseback and four or five on foot. Don Quixote's heart beat quick and Sancho's quailed with fear, for the persons approaching them carried lances and bucklers, and were in very warlike guise. Don Quixote turned to Sancho and said, If I could make use of my weapons, and my promise had not tied my hands, I would count this host that comes against us, but cakes and fancy bread, but perhaps it may prove something different from what we apprehend. The men on horseback now came up, and raising their lances surrounded Don Quixote in silence, and pointed them at his back and breast, menacing him with death. 1. Of those on foot, putting his finger to his lips as a sign to him to be silent, seized Rocinante's bridle and drew him out of the road, and the others driving Sancho and Dapple before them, and all maintaining a strange silence, followed in the steps of the one who led Don Quixote. The latter two or three times attempted to ask where they were taking him to and what they wanted, but the instant he began to open his lips they threatened to close them with the points of their lances, and Sancho fared the same way, for the moment he seemed about to. Don Quixote Chapter LXVI 783 Speak one of those on foot, punched him with a goad, and Dapple likewise, as if he too wanted to talk. Night set in, they quickened their pace, and the fears of the two prisoners grew greater, especially as they heard themselves assailed with minus get on, ye troglodytes, silence, ye barbarians, march, ye cannibals, no murmuring, ye Scythians, don't open your eyes, ye murderous polyphemes, ye blood minus thirsty lions, and such like names with which their captors harassed the ears of the wretched master and man. Sancho went along saying to himself, we, tortolites, barbers, animals. I don't like those names at all, it's in a bad wind our corn is being winnowed, 
Misfortune comes upon us all at once like sticks on a dog, and God grant it may be no worse than them that this unlucky adventure has in store for us. Don Quixote rode completely dazed, unable with the aid of all his wits to make out what could be the meaning of these abusive names they called them, and the only conclusion he could arrive at was that there was no good to be hoped for and much evil to be feared. And now, about an hour after midnight, they reached a castle which Don Quixote saw at once was the Duke's, where they had been but a short time before. God bless me, said he as he recognized the mansion, what does this mean? It is all courtesy and politeness in this house, but with the vanquished good turns into evil, and evil into worse. They entered the chief court of the castle, and found it prepared and fitted up in a style that added to their amazement and doubled their fears, as will be seen in the following chapter. Don Quixote Chapter LX VI 784 Chapter LXIX Of the strangest and most extraordinary adventure that Befell Don Quixote in the whole course of this great history. The horsemen dismounted, and, together with the men on foot, without a moment's delay taking up Sancho and Don Quixote bodily, they carried them into the court, all round which near a hundred torches fixed in sockets were burning, besides above five hundred lamps in the corridors, so that in spite of the night, which was somewhat dark, the want of daylight could not be perceived. In the middle of the court was a catafalque, raised about two yards above the ground and covered completely by an immense canopy of black velvet, and on the steps all round it white wax tapers burned in more than a hundred silver candlesticks. Upon the catafalque was seen the dead body of a damsel so lovely that by her beauty she made death itself look beautiful. She lay with her head resting upon a cushion of brocade and crowned with a garland of sweet minus smelling flowers of divers sorts, her hands crossed upon her bosom, and between them a branch of yellow palm of victory. On one side of the court was erected a stage, where upon two chairs were seated two persons who from having crowns on their heads and scepters in their hands appeared to be kings of some sort, whether real or mock ones. By the side of this stage, which was reached by steps, were two other chairs on which the men carrying the prisoners seated Don Quixote and Sancho, all in silence, and by signs giving them to understand that they too were to he silent, which however, they would have been without any signs for their amazement at all they saw held them tongue minus tied. And now two persons of distinction, who were at once recognized by Don Quixote as his hosts the Duke and Duchess, ascended the stage attended by a numerous suite, and seated themselves on two gorgeous chairs close to the two kings, as they seemed to be. Who would not have been amazed at this? Nor was this all, for Don Quixote had perceived that the dead body on the catafalque was that of the fair Altisidora. As the Duke and Duchess mounted the stage Don Quixote and Sancho rose, and made them a profound obeisance which they returned by bowing their heads slightly. At this moment an official crossed over. And approaching Sancho threw over him a robe of black buckram painted all over with flames of fire, and taking off his cap put upon his head a mitre such as those undergoing the sentence of the holy office wear, and whispered in his ear that he must not open his lips, or they would put a gag upon him, or take his life. Sancho surveyed himself from head to foot and saw himself all ablaze with flames, but as they did not burn him, he did not care two farthings for them. He took off the mitre and seeing painted with devils he put it on again, saying to himself, well, so far those don't burn me nor do these carry me off. Don Quixote surveyed him too, and though fear had got the better of his faculties, he could not help smiling to see the figure Sancho presented. And now from underneath the catafalque, so it seemed, there rose a low sweet sound of flutes, which, coming unbroken by human, voice, for their silence itself kept silence, had a soft and languishing effect. Then, beside. Don Quixote. Chapter LXIX 785. The pillow of what seemed to be the dead body, suddenly appeared a fair youth in a Roman habit, who, to the accompaniment of a harp which he himself played, sang in a sweet and clear voice these two stanzas. While fair Altisidora, who the sport of cold Don Quixote's cruelty hath been, returns to life, and in this magic court the dames and sables come to grace the scene, and while her matrons all in seemly sort my lady robes in bays and bombazine, her beauty and her sorrows will I sing with defter quill than touch the Thracian string. 
But not in life alone, methinks, to me belongs the office, lady, when my tongue is cold and deaf, believe me, unto thee my voice shall raise its tributary song. My soul, from this strait prison minus house set free, as o'er the Stygian lake it floats along, thy praises singing still shall hold its way, and make the waters of oblivion stay. At this point one of the two that looked like kings exclaimed, Enough, enough, divine singer. It would be an endless task to put before us now the death and the charms of the peerless Altisidora, not dead as the ignorant world imagines, but living in the voice of fame and in the penance which Sancho Panza, here present, has to undergo to restore her to the long minus lost light. Do thou therefore, O Rhadamanthus, who sittest in judgment with me in the murky caverns of Dis, as thou knowest all that the inscrutable fates have decreed touching the resuscitation of this damsel announce and declare it at once, that the happiness we look forward to from her restoration be no longer deferred. No sooner had Minus the fellow judge of Rhadamanthus said this, than Rhadamanthus rising up said, Ho, officials of this house, high and low, great and small, make haste hither one and all, and print on Sancho's face four minus and minus twenty smacks, and give him twelve pinches and six pin thrusts in the back and arms, for upon this ceremony depends the restoration of Altisidora. On hearing this Sancho broke silence and cried out, By all that's good, I'll as soon let my face be smacked or handled as turn more. Body o' me. What has handling my face got to do with the resurrection of this damsel? The old woman took kindly to the blitz, they enchant Dulcinea, and whip me in order to disenchant her, Altisidora dies of ailments God was pleased to send her, and to bring her to life again they must give me four minus and minus twenty smacks, and prick holes in my body with pins, and raise wheels on my arms with pinches. Try those jokes on a brother minus and minus law, I'm an old dog and tuss, tuss is no use with me. Thou shalt die, said Radamanthus in a loud voice, relent, thou tiger, humble thyself, proud Nimrod, Suffer, and he silent, for no impossibilities are asked of thee, it is not for thee to inquire into the difficulties in this matter, smack thou must be, prick thou shalt see thyself, and with pinches thou must be made to howl. Ho, I say, officials, obey my. Don Quixote Chapter LXIX 786 Orders, or by the word of an honest man, ye shall see what ye were born for. At this some six duennas, advancing across the court, made their appearance in procession, one after the other, four of them with spectacles, and all with their right hands uplifted, showing four fingers of wrist to make their hands look longer, as is the fashion now minus a minus days. No sooner had Sancho caught sight of them than, bellowing like a bull, he exclaimed, I might let myself be handled by all the world, but allow duennas to touch me minus not a bit of it. Scratch my face, as my master was served in this very castle, run me through the body with burnished daggers, pinch my arms with red minus hot pincers, I'll bear all in patience to serve these gentlefolk, but I won't let duennas touch me, though the devil should carry me off. Here Don Quixote too broke silence, saying to Sancho, Have patience, my son, and gratify these noble persons, and give all thanks to heaven that it has infused such virtue into thy person that by its sufferings thou canst disenchant the enchanted and restore to life the dead. The duennas were now close to Sancho, and he having become more tractable and reasonable, settling himself well in his chair presented his face and beard to the first, who delivered him a smack very stoutly laid on, and then made him a low curtsy. Less politeness and less paint, Sonora duenna, said Sancho, by God your hands smell of vinegar minus wash. In fine, all the duennas smacked him and several others of the household pinched him, but what he could not stand was being pricked by the pins, and so, apparently out of patience, he started up out of his chair and seizing a lighted torch that stood near him fell upon the duennas and the whole set of his tormentors, exclaiming, Begone, ye ministers of hell, I'm not made of brass not to feel such out minus of minus the minus way tortures. At this instant Altisidora, who probably was tired of having been so long lying on her back, turned on her side, seeing which the bystanders cried out almost with one voice, Altisidora is alive. Altisidora lives. Radamanthus bade Sancho put away his wrath, as the object they had in view was now attained. 
When Don Quixote saw Altisidora move, he went on his knees to Sancho saying to him, Now is the time, son of my bowels, not to call thee my squire, for thee to give thyself some of those lashes thou art bound to lay on for the disenchantment of Dulcinea. Now, I say, is the time when the virtue that is in thee is ripe, and endowed with efficacy to work the good that is looked for from thee. To which Sancho made answer, that's trick upon trick, I think, and not honey upon pancakes, a nice thing it would be for a whipping to come now on the top of pinches. Don Quixote Chapter LXIX 787 Smacks and pin minus proddings You had better take a big stone and tie it round my neck, and pitch me into a well, I should not mind it much, if I'm to be always made the cow of the wedding for the cure of other people's ailments. Leave me alone, or else by God I'll fling the whole thing to the dogs, let come what may. Altisidora had by this time sat up on the catafalque, and as she did so the clarion sounded, accompanied by the flutes, and the voices of all present exclaiming, Long life to Altisidora! Long life to Altisidora! The Duke and Duchess and the Kings Minus and Rhadamanthus stood up, and all, together with Don Quixote and Sancho, advanced to receive her and take her down from the catafalque, and she, making as though she were recovering from a swoon, bowed her head to the duke and duchess and to the kings, and looking sideways at Don Quixote, said to him, God forgive thee, insensible knight, for through thy cruelty I have been, to me it seems, more than a thousand years in the other world, and to thee, the most compassionate upon earth, I render thanks for the life I am now in possession of. From this day forth, friend Sancho, count as thine six smocks of mine which I bestow upon thee, to make as many shirts for thyself, and if they are not all quite, Whole, at any rate they are all clean. Sancho kissed her hands in gratitude, kneeling, and with the mitre in his hand. The duke bade them take it from him, and give him back his cap and doublet, and remove the flaming robe. Sancho begged the duke to let them leave him the robe and mitre, as he wanted to take them home for a token and memento of that unexampled adventure. The duchess said they must leave them with him, for he knew already what a great friend of his she was. The duke then gave orders that the court should be cleared, and that all should retire to their chambers, and that Don Quixote and Sancho should be conducted to their old quarters. Don Quixote Chapter LXIX 788 Chapter LXX Which follows 60-9 and deals with matters Indispensable for the clear comprehension of this history Sancho slept that night in a cot in the same chamber with Don Quixote, a thing he would have gladly excused if he could for he knew very well that with questions and answers his master would not let him sleep, and he was in no humor for talking much, as he still felt the pain of his late martyrdom, which interfered with his freedom of speech, and it would have been more to his taste to sleep in a hovel alone, than in that luxurious chamber in company. And so well founded did his apprehension prove, and so correct was his anticipation that scarcely had his master got into bed when he said, What dost thou think of tonight's adventure, Sancho? Great and mighty is the power of cold minus hearted scorn, for thou with thine own eyes hast seen Altisidora slain, not by arrows, nor by the sword, nor by any warlike weapon, nor by deadly poisons, but by the thought of the sternness and scorn with which I have always treated her. She might have died in welcome, said Sancho, when she pleased and how she pleased, and she might have left me alone, for I never made her fall in love or scorned her. I don't know nor can I imagine how the recovery of Altisidora, a damsel more fanciful than wise, can have, as I have said before, anything to do with the sufferings of Sancho Panza. Now I begin to see plainly and clearly that there are enchanters and enchanted people in the world, and may God deliver me from them, since I can't deliver myself, and so I beg of your worship to let me sleep and not ask me any more questions, unless you want me to throw myself out of the window. Sleep, Sancho my friend, said Don Quixote, if the pin prodding and pinches thou hast received, and the smacks administered to thee will let thee. No pain came up to the insult of the smacks, said Sancho, for the simple reason that it was duennas, confound them, that gave them to me. But once more I entreat your worship to let me sleep, for sleep is relief from misery to those who are miserable when awake. Be it so, and God be with thee, said Don Quixote.
They fell asleep, both of them, and Said Hamid, the author of this great history, took this opportunity to record and relate what it was that induced the Duke and Duchess to get up the elaborate plot that has been described. The bachelor Samson Carrasco, he says, not forgetting how he as the Knight of the Mirrors had been vanquished and overthrown by Don Quixote, which defeat and overthrow upset all his plans, resolved to try his hand again. Don Quixote Chapter LXX 789 Hoping for better luck than he had before, and so, having learned where Don Quixote was from the page who brought the letter and present to Sancho's wife, Teresa Panza, he got himself new armor and another horse, and put a white moon upon his shield, and to carry his arms he had a mule led by a peasant, not by Tom Seashell his former squire for fear he should be recognized by Sancho or Don Quixote. He came to the duke's castle, and the duke informed him of the road and route Don Quixote had taken with the intention of being present at the justs at Saragossa. He told him, too, of the jokes he had practiced upon him, and of the device for the disenchantment of Dulcinea at the expense of Sancho's backside, and finally he gave him an account of the trick Sancho had played upon his master, making him believe that Dulcinea was enchanted and turned into a country wench, and of how the duchess, his wife, had persuaded Sancho that it was he himself who was deceived, inasmuch. As Dulcinea was really enchanted, at which the bachelor laughed not a little, and marveled. As well at the sharpness and simplicity of Sancho as at the length to which Don Quixote's madness went. The duke begged of him if he found him, whether he overcame him or not, to return that way and let him know the result. This the bachelor did, he set out in quest of Don Quixote, and not finding him at Saragossa, he went on, and how he fared has been already told. He returned to the duke's castle and told him all, what the conditions of the combat were, and how Don Quixote was now, like a loyal knight minus errant, returning to keep his promise of retiring to his village for a year, by which time, said the bachelor, he might perhaps be cured of his madness, for that was the object that had led him to adopt these disguises, as it was a sad thing for a gentleman of such good parts as Don Quixote to be a madman. And so he took his leave of the duke, and went home to his village to wait there for Don Quixote, who was coming after him. Thereupon the duke seized the opportunity of practicing this mystification upon him, so much did he enjoy everything connected with Sancho and Don Quixote. He had the roads about the castle far and near, everywhere he thought Don Quixote was likely to pass on his return, occupied by large numbers of his servants on foot and on horseback, who were to bring him to the castle, by fair means or foul, if they met him. They did meet him, and sent word to the duke, who, having already settled what was to be done, as soon as he heard of his arrival, ordered the torches and lamps in the court to be lit and Altisidora to be placed on the catafalque with all the pomp and ceremony that has been described, the whole affair being so well arranged and acted that it differed, but little from reality. And Said Hamid says, moreover, that for his part he considers the concoctors of the joke as crazy as the victims of it, and that the duke and duchess were not two fingers breadth removed from being something like fools themselves when they took such pains to make game of a pair of fools. As for the latter, one was sleeping soundly and the other lying awake occupied with his desultory thoughts, when daylight came to them bringing with it the desire to rise, for the lazy down was never a delight to Don Quixote, victor or vanquished. Altisidora, come back from death to life as Don Quixote fancied, following up the freak of her lord and lady, entered the chamber, crowned with the garland she had worn on the catafalque, and in a robe of white taffeta embroidered with gold flowers, her hair flowing loose over her shoulders, and leaning upon a staff of fine black ebony. Don Quixote, disconcerted and in confusion at Don Quixote Chapter LXX 790 Her appearance huddled himself up and well minus night covered himself altogether with the sheets and counterpane of the bed, tongue minus tied, and unable to offer her any civility. Altisidora seated herself on a chair at the head of the bed and, after a deep sigh, said to him in a feeble, soft voice, when women of rank and modest maidens trample honor underfoot and give a loose to the tongue that breaks through every impediment, publishing abroad the inmost secrets of their hearts, they are reduced to sore extremities. Such a one am I, Senor Don Quixote of La Mancha, crushed, conquered, love minus smitten, but yet patient under suffering and virtuous, and so much, 
so that my heart broke with grief and I lost my life. For the last two days I have been dead, slain by the thought of the cruelty with which thou hast treated me, obdurate knight. O harder thou than marble to my plaint! Or at least believed to be dead by all who saw me, and had it not been that love, taking pity on me, let my recovery rest upon the sufferings of this good squire, there I should have remained in the other world. Love might very well have let it rest upon the sufferings of my ass, and I should have been obliged to him, said Sancho. But tell me, Sonora Minus, and may heaven send you a tenderer lover than my master Minus, what did you see in the other world? What goes on in hell? For of course that's where one who dies in despair is bound for. To tell you the truth, said Altisidora, I cannot have died outright, for I did not go into hell. Had I gone in, it is very certain I should never have come out again, do what I might. The truth is, I came to the gate, where some dozen or so of devils were playing tennis, all in breeches and doublets, with falling collars trimmed with Flemish bone lace, and ruffles of the same that served them for wristbands, with four fingers breadth of the arms exposed to make their hands look longer, in their hands they held rackets of fire, but what amazed me still more was that books, apparently full of wind and rubbish, served them for tennis balls, a strange and marvelous thing. This, however, did not astonish me so much as to observe that, although with players it is usual for the winners to be glad and the losers sorry, there in that game all were growling, all were snarling, and all were cursing one. Another. That's no wonder, said Sancho, for devils, whether playing or not, can never be. Content, win or lose. Very likely, said Altisidora, but there is another thing that surprises me too, I mean surprised me then, and that was that no ball outlasted the first throw or was of any use a second time, and it was wonderful the constant succession there was of books, new and old. To one of them, a brand minus new, while minus bound one, they gave such a stroke that they knocked the guts out of it and scattered the leaves about. Look what book that is, said one devil to another, and the other replied, it is the second part of the history of Don Quixote of La Mancha, not by side Hamid, the original author, but by an Aragonese who by his own account is of Tordesillas. Out of this with it, said the first, and into the depths of hell with. Don Quixote Chapter LXX 791 It out of my sight. Is it so bad, said the other. So bad is it, said the first, that if I had set myself deliberately to make a worse, I could not have done it. They then went on with their game, knocking other books about, and I having heard them mention the name of Don Quixote whom I love and adore so, took care to retain this vision in my memory. A vision it must have been. No doubt, said Don Quixote, for there is no other eye in the world, this history has been going about here for some time from hand to hand, but it does not stay long in any, for everybody gives it a taste of his foot. I am not disturbed by hearing that I am wandering in a fantastic shape in the darkness of the pit or in the daylight above, for I am not the one that history treats of. If it should be good, faithful, and true, it will have ages of life, but if it should be bad, from its birth to its burial will not be a very long journey. Altisidora was about to proceed with her complaint against Don Quixote, when he said to her, I have several times told you, Sonora, that it grieves me you should have set your affections upon me, as from mine they can only receive gratitude, but no return. I was born to belong to Dulcinea del Toboso, and the fates, if there are any, dedicated me to her, and to suppose that any other beauty can take the place she occupies in my heart is to suppose an impossibility. This frank declaration should suffice to make you retire within the bounds of your modesty, for no one can bind himself to do impossibilities. Hearing this, Altisidora, with a show of anger and agitation, exclaimed, God's life. Don Stockfish, soul of a mortar, stone of a date, more obstinate and obdurate than a clown asked a favor when he has his mind made up, if I fall upon you I'll tear your eyes out. Do you fancy, Don Vanquished, Don Cudgeled, that I died for your sake? All that you have seen to Minus Knight has been make Minus believe. I'm not the woman to let the black of my nail suffer for such a camel, much less die.
That I can well believe, said Sancho, for all that about lovers pining to death is absurd, they may talk of it, but as for doing it minus Judas may believe that. While they were talking, the musician, singer, and poet, who had sung the two stanzas given above came in, and making a profound obeisance to Don Quixote said, Will your worship, Sir Knight, reckon and retain me in the number of your most faithful servants, for I have long been a great admirer of yours as well because of your fame as because of your achievements? Will your worship tell me who you are, replied Don Quixote, so that my courtesy may be answerable to your deserts? The young man replied that he was the musician and songster of the night before. Of a truth, said Don Quixote, your worship has a most excellent voice, but what you sang did not seem to me very much to the purpose, for what have Garcilaso's stanzas to do with the death of this lady? Don't be surprised at that, returned the musician, for with the callow poets of our day the way is for every one to write as he pleases and pilfer where he chooses, whether it. Don Quixote Chapter LXX 792 Be germane to the matter or not, and now minus a minus days there is no piece of silliness they can sing or write that is not set down to poetic license. Don Quixote was about to reply, but was prevented by the Duke and Duchess, who came in to see him, and with them there followed a long and delightful conversation in the course of which Sancho said so many droll and saucy things that he left the duke and duchess wondering not only at his simplicity, but at his sharpness. Don Quixote begged their permission to take his departure that same day, inasmuch as for a vanquished knight like himself it was fitter he should live in a pig minus sty than in a royal palace. They gave it very readily, and the duchess asked him if Altisidora was in his good graces. He replied, Sonora, let me tell your ladyship that this damsel's ailment comes entirely of idleness, and the cure for it is honest and constant employment. She herself has told me that lace is worn in hell, and as she must know how to make it, let it never be out of her hands, for when she is occupied in shifting the bobbins to and fro, the image or images of what she loves will not shift to and fro in her thoughts. This is the truth, this is my opinion, and this is my advice. And mine, added Sancho, for I never in all my life saw a lace minus maker that died for love, when damsels are at work their minds are more set on finishing their tasks than on thinking of their loves. I speak from my own experience, for when I'm digging I never think of my old woman, I mean my Teresa Panza, whom I love better than my own eyelids. You say well, Sancho, said the Duchess, and I will take care that my Altisidora employs herself henceforward in needlework of some sort, for she is extremely expert at it. There is no occasion to have recourse to that remedy, Sonora, said Altisidora, for the mere thought of the cruelty with which this vagabond villain has treated me will suffice to blot him out of my memory without any other device, with your highness's leave I will retire, not to have before my eyes, I won't say his rueful countenance, but his abominable, ugly looks. That reminds me of the common saying, that he that rails is ready to forgive, said the Duke. Altisidora then, pretending to wipe away her tears with a handkerchief, made an obeisance to her master and mistress and quitted the room. Ill luck betide thee, poor damsel, said Sancho, ill luck betide thee. Thou hast fallen in with a soul as dry as a rush and a heart as hard as oak. Had it been me, I faith another cock would have crowed to thee. So the conversation came to an end, and Don Quixote dressed himself and dined with the Duke and Duchess, and set out the same evening. Don Quixote Chapter LXX 793 Chapter LXXI Of what passed between Don Quixote and his squire Sancho On the way to their village The van and afflicted Don Quixote went along very downcast in one respect and very happy in another. His sadness arose from his defeat, and his satisfaction from the thought of the virtue that lay in Sancho, as had been proved by the resurrection of Altisidora, though it was with difficulty he could persuade himself that the love minus smitten damsel had been really dead. Sancho went along anything but cheerful, for it grieved him that Altisidora had not kept her promise of giving him the smocks, and turning this over in his mind he said to his master, Surely, senor, 
I'm the most unlucky doctor in the world, there's many a physician that, after killing the sick man he had to cure, requires to be paid for his work, though it is only signing a bit of a list of medicines, that the apothecary and naughty makes up, and, there, his labor is over, but with me. Though to cure somebody else costs me drops of blood, smacks, pinches, pin proddings, and whippings, nobody gives me a farthing. Well, I swear by all that's good if they put another patient into my hands, they'll have to grease them for me before I cure him, for, as they say, it's by his singing the abbot gets his dinner, and I'm not going to believe that heaven has bestowed upon me the virtue I have, that I should be dealing it out to others all for nothing. Thou art Art right, Sancho my friend, said Don Quixote, and Altisidora has behaved very badly in not giving thee the smock she promised, and although that virtue of thine is gratis data minus as it has cost thee no study whatever, any more than such study as thy personal sufferings may be minus I can say for myself that if thou wouldst have payment for the lashes on account of the disenchant of Dulcinea, I would have given it to thee freely ere this. I am not sure, however, whether payment will comport with the cure, and I would not have the reward interfere with the medicine. I think there will be nothing lost by trying it, consider how much thou wouldst have, Sancho, and whip thyself at once, and pay thyself down with thine own hand, as thou hast money of mine. At this proposal, Sancho opened his eyes and his ears a palm's breadth wide, and in his heart very readily acquiesced in whipping himself, and said he to his master, Very well then, senor, I'll hold myself in readiness to gratify your worship's wishes if I'm to profit by it for the love of my wife and children forces me to seem grasping. Let your worship say how much you will pay me for each lash I give myself. If Sancho, replied Don Quixote, I were to requite thee as the importance and nature of the cure deserves, the treasures of Venice, the mines of Potosi, would be insufficient to pay thee. See what thou hast of mine, and put a price on each lash. Don Quixote Chapter LXXI 794 Of them, said Sancho, there are three thousand three hundred and odd, of these I have given myself five, the rest remain, let the five go for the odd ones, and let us take the three thousand three hundred, which at a quarter real apiece, for I will not take less though the whole world should bid me, make three thousand three hundred quarter reals. The three thousand are one thousand five hundred half reals, which makes seven hundred and fifty reals, and the three hundred make a hundred and fifty half reals, which come to seventy minus five reals, which added to the seven hundred and fifty make eight hundred and twenty minus five reals in all. These I will stop out of what I have belonging to your worship, and I'll return home rich in content, though well whipped, for there's no taking trout minus, but I say no more. blessed Sancho. Oh dear Sancho, said Don Quixote, how we shall be bound to serve thee, Dulcinea, and I all the days of our lives that heaven may grant us. If she returns to her lost shape, and it cannot be, but that she will, her misfortune will have been good fortune, and my defeat a most happy triumph. But look here, Sancho, when wilt thou begin the scourging? For if thou wilt make short work of it, I will give thee a hundred reals over and above. When said Sancho, this night without fail. Let your worship order it so that we pass it out of doors and in the open air, and I'll scarify myself. Night, longed for by Don Quixote with the greatest anxiety in the world, came at last, though it seemed to him that the wheels of Apollo's car had broken down, and that the day was drawing itself out longer than usual, just as is the case with lovers, who never make the reckoning of their desires agree with time. They made their way at length and among some pleasant trees that stood a little distance from the road, and their vacating Rocinante's saddle and Dapple's pack minus saddle, they stretched themselves on the green grass, and made their supper off Sancho's stores, and he making a powerful and flexible whip out of Dapple's halter and headstall retreated about twenty paces from his master among some beech trees. Don Quixote seeing him march off with such resolution and spirit, said to him, Take care, my friend, not to cut thyself to pieces. Allow the lashes to wait for one another, and do not be in so great a hurry as to run thyself out of breath midway, I mean, do not lay on so strenuously as to make thy life fail thee before thou hast reached the desired number, and that thou mayest not lose by a card too much or too little, 
I will station myself apart and count on my rosary here the lashes thou givest thyself. May heaven help thee as thy good intention deserves. Pledges don't distress a good payer, said Sancho, I mean to lay on in such a way as without killing myself to hurt myself, for in that, no doubt, lies the essence of this miracle. He then stripped himself from the waist upwards, and snatching up the rope he began to lay on and Don Quixote to count the lashes. He might have given himself six or eight when he began to think the joke no trifle, and its price very low, and holding his hand for a moment, he told his master that he cried off on the score of a blind bargain, for each of those. 